So the relation to between the real and representation, I mean, what is this thing called representation? Uh, is representation itself a good thing or a bad thing? Or is representation the pharmacon, which is both the poison and the remedy? Or, and the whole question of what is the attitude of a literary scholar to representation versus you know, a scientist? What does the representation do? And I think, and we have seen this happen in a variety of you know, theories in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, the ability of, I think, a certain kind of you know, theoretical thinking in the humanities to simultaneously deal with, invest in, in representation, and at the same time, void representation. And here is what I mean by that. This happens typically in any conversation. You and I are talking, and then suddenly you tell me, Radha, it is not about you, or everything, oh my God, you make it about yourself. And I think it's not about you either, so who the heck is it about? Any situation, two people, three people, twenty people, a good example is death. When somebody dies, who is death about? Not about the person who died, he or she is not there. Not about you because you did not die, so who is it about? So I think any profound situation kind of points up the way in which that to be representative, you need to avoid representation. When people come together, you know, incommensurable situations, Gaddafi, you know, Libya, Obama, a bunch of people having a conversation, and each one of them said, okay, what is it about? You might say it's about the separation of church and state, you know, satanic versus, you know, or, or you might say it's about blasphemy, it's about, you know, secular truth versus. But in most of these situations, I think after a point, the real question is that any kind of a real dialogue does not take place unless in a radical way that you void representation out by saying that literally, so who is it really about? And I think, and, and that way of knowing, which is what I would like to call a vulnerable knowing, where you continue making truth claims. You don't just say, I won't make truth claims for lack of, you know, nations or whatever you do. But the real issue is how to make a truth claim, and what I've been saying in the recent work, to valorize one's truth as an error. And I think some of Butler's work has been doing it for a little while. And let me conclude with this. So clearly making a truth claim, uh, but then how do you make the truth claim vulnerable? <coughs> And by vulnerable, I do not mean the kind of philosophical gesture where you say, God damn it, I know I'm vulnerable. <laughs> that, you know, to be vulnerable, I know I'm vulnerable and you flex your muscle, but a different kind of vulnerability. And to that, I turn to, you know, one of my main men, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, uh, with, with a nod to phenomenology, and with that, I promise I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, the whole idea of, if you are in literature, how do you hold your position as a reader? Do you read your position arbitrarily, non-judgmentally? See you again, thanks again. Or do you hold your position and not make a truth claim? As in, you know, I'm just doing something, it is all description. Or do you make a truth claim? And the really important thing that I'm saying is two things. What does it mean to valorize a truth? Is it possible to valorize truth as if it were an error? And the second question is, in the name of whom is the valorization being made? In my name, your name, in the name of a relationality to come. And then this basic conversation, two people talking, hey, what did we talk about? It's not about you. Okay, pal, fine, I'm backing off. Maybe it's being egoistic. Is it about you? How do you know that? Is it about the space between you and me? So this doubleness of representation where the about, what is it about, has to be simultaneously asserted and, in a sense, eviscerated. And for me, the example, how many of you are tennis fans? Oh, God, I hope today, I hope... Federer wins this afternoon, or we'll see. Um, you know, you go and see a game, and this is, I, 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 I use that as an example in my second book, and I went off on it for 20 pages, you know. And the basic thing is, okay, you're sitting at a certain place, and the ball falls, and you think the ball is in. And then, you know, the replay says, the, you know, the ball is egregiously out. So what do you learn from a situation like that? So is there a correct call? And here is a situation, okay, given where you're sitting, perceptually, you could not have seen it in any other way. That is how, even though in another, what, you know, Murla Ponte would call the pre-personal one, you say, well, had I been sitting over there, I would have seen it differently. But that is not experientially mine until I go over there. So here is a double perception of saying, ineluctably. Where I am sitting from, whatever that perspective might be, could be politics of location, a la Adrian Rich, or could be a la Foucault, subject positionality, which kind of condemns you to, you have a certain givenness to it. I see it a certain way, and I cannot but see it a certain way given where I am. And I have to state it in quite those terms. The truth of what I see is, 
you know, you to me look a certain way, Jack, from where I am, but if I were there, you might look, you know, something else. But the question is, having said that, how do I valorize it? The valorization is where you say, valorize it as a potential error. So this doubleness, it seems to me, is what too many people is confusing about literature. So what the heck are you saying? Are you saying something in a strong way and sticking with it? But if you're saying strong, but at the same time you're saying, my God, you're kind of not quite sure, it comes across as weak thinking, but it seems to me, indeed, it's not. But I would like to claim it is that kind of vulnerable thinking where representation is simultaneously asserted, but its truth claims are almost celebrated as if they were post-representational or you valorize them in the name of an error, uh, which is where I'm going. And I guess all of this has been an interesting combination of you know, errors and hopefully some insights. And again, thank you for you know, staying with me. Uh, thank you very much. And I would be just honored, delighted to have questions, comments, and especially where you think my point of view is egregiously wrong, other position on the same issues. Thank you again very, very much. And again, a huge warm welcome to the prospective students. Hope you have a great time here uh, and meet the people and, and have a blast. Have a carnival. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you again for uh, No, thank you. Cheers. So, please. Hey Becky, Hi. good to see you. Good to see you. How's your work going? Um, How's my elbow? Great. Um, <laughs> the question is, I was speaking to an uh, old professor of mine, and he said that he didn't think theory should be taught to undergraduates uh, because they. Can I meet with him? <laughs> <laughs> Can you quarrel over pizza, beer? <laughs> they didn't quarrel over this uh, a lot, and his response was that they weren't mature enough in literature to be able to discuss theory. And I, what I'm curious about, what I'm asking you is, do you think that it's not possible for them to be able to discuss theory because the ideas are too complex or because they don't have the language that enables them to talk about the theory, if that makes sense? Like yeah. A lot of the language that, you know, exegesis and all of these things that people use when they talk um, about literature can use um, people who don't know those terminology very well. So, what would you say? To Great that? question. I, I, as I'm, if the other people who have questions to say, Mary, I feel free to jump in. If you have any, uh, you know, angles pertaining to Becky's question, happy to kind of add to the agenda. Uh, as you're thinking about it, do you have any? What do you think? I mean, what's your own response to what I respond to you? Does it seem like a reasonable question? Not reasonable. My, I mean, I kind of gave myself away by saying that I think that learning a language that, learning the terminology or the language, I mean, I suppose if you were learning in a science classroom, you would have to learn the language of science to be able to engage in any kind of, not just conversation, but experiment. And I, I feel like it's the same literature and the humanities, and if so, I, I would hope that we could have a terminology class. Yeah, I mean, I have a few responses that jump in any one of you at any, you know, you, you know, at any point. One easy way to answer is, you know, by way of Terry Eagleton's book, Literary Theory, that everybody has a theory. You may not call it that. You might call it homespun, you know, grandma's wisdom, mom's wisdom, or some folklore. Uh, so any act of understanding doesn't ever coincide with the original. You're thinking about whatever that means. I'm thinking about it. I fell in love. I had a cup of coffee. Something happened to me. I'm thinking about it. I read a movie. You know, I, I read a movie. Synesthesia. Oh, whatever. You know, I saw something, and you know, come back and you're thinking about it. So in that sense, you know, if thinking about is a kind of theory, and their theory, all the theory would mean is things ipso facto don't make sense. They require an act of intervention. They require an act of mediation. And the question is, so in that sense, there is nothing called a non-theoretical you know, reading. 
Or you can go to someone like Gramsci, who would talk about the relationship between common sense and intellectual wisdom. You know, all human beings are intellectuals, you know, but the intellectual is only a professional who does certain kinds of jobs. But the intellectual, the relationship between all human beings and that particular kind of activity called the intellectual. So every act of, you know, understanding to that extent is theoretical. And by theory, you mean a kind of a stepping back. And the next question is, what happens when it becomes more formalized? And here my response would be clearly, I mean, I love teaching. Uh, you took a course with me, and thanks for putting up with, uh, you know, with, with that whole uh, quarter. I mean, I, I love to teach undergrad courses, and I say with a certain panache and hubris, theory is sexy. You know, it's a kind of a, and all I mean by that is, here is my, you know, my, my uh, conversational gambit. I tell people, hey, look, at any given moment, life is more complex than theory. We all live amazingly complicated lives, all kinds of positions, contradiction, hyphenation, incommensurability, different kind of dilemmas in being who you are, lifestyles, choices. So the humble thing theory is doing is trying its very best to catch up with existence itself. So first of all, at the level of content, life is more complicated. And the question is, in trying to understand it, you know, we, we, we produce a kind of a secondary vocabulary. Now, for me, I have a double response to it, which I try in some way giving it in, in a kind of occupying position symptomatically in the paper. I have no particular investment in methodology as such. But the real question is, how is the methodology deployed? How is it disseminated? Clearly, if theory becomes a way of, you know, grandstanding and using a certain kind of, uh, I mean, I always think about it, you know, examples of, supposing somebody said, okay, talk about grief and melancholy. And you say, can I talk about it without Freud? No, you can't use Freud. Can you still talk about it? It is that kind of situation, which you see in Butler's work, Precarious Life, you know. So the whole notion of, I mean, I have something to say, but then to say that, I need to go to whatever, Aristotle, Gandhi, whoever that it might be, and the question is, okay, pal, cut it out. No bibliography, no references, just speak from who you are. So at that particular point, I tell my student, all these references are no big deal. It's almost like having a normal conversation. I'm having a conversation with Jack, and I suddenly say, Susan said, and he said, who the hell is Susan? He doesn't know who that person is, until they tell you who that person is. Aha, Susan is, or, you know, Asha is. So, similarly, when people have a professional conversation, the bibliography is not intended always to mystify, or to make you feel like an idiot, but that I'm the one, ah, look at me. You know, I'm erudite, and I'm Chevy Chase, and you are not. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm erudite, and you are not. If it's that, then clearly I'm against it. If it's anti-democratic, but there's nothing intrinsically anti-democratic about it. The, the, other, the other comment I have is often people would say, I have lost the spontaneous ability to enjoy it. That I don't quite understand. I mean, why can not have a form of enjoyment where you enjoy the poem and at the same time you talk about it and use terms like prosopopoeia or, you know, apotheosis or metaphor or whatever, or to be able to analyze Clearly that interferes, if you will, in a certain way with the initial act of enjoying it. But when somebody said that there is some kind of a clash between the two ways of knowing, I find that difficult to understand. Uh, you know, uh, but, but ultimately, does everyone have to do it? No, I mean, you, you take a course in literature, and then you say, okay, this seemed interesting. But some of, them, some of you might say, okay, wow, this seems interesting, I'm going to go in that direction. And if you do go in that direction, then certain ways of talking become important, they become de rigueur, then it becomes a field of scholarship, and your accountability becomes double. <coughs> the accountability is both to the world at large, but also to your own particular world, in which case, I mean, the thing to do is to write as many in different voices as you can, so that it doesn't become just one voice dominating the other. So those would be, so my answer to that would be, uh, you know, why would it be too early to start theory? Uh, you know, same thing as, you know, learning tennis or learning the piano or bicycling or whatever. I, you start at whatever point, so long as the, the, the relevance is explained. And to get a sense of it, that is the moment where I always say, think of the way in which you talk about theory, i.e. Richards, practical criticism, and then theory. So somebody, okay, I've learned the theory, I've learned Freud, I've done Lacan. And then it's absolutely justifiable for a student to ask, teach me how to apply it. 